Players are being cautious. They're being friendly. They're saving me from accidentally going live. Okay, I think we did it. Hello, world. Uh, so it usually takes people a minute or two to get going. So uh, while they're doing that, I'll say hello to everyone who's here and folks who are uh, listening on or watching on a recording because uh, this uh, debate that we're having today, a little bit of a departure for us, is uh, going out uh, on uh, uh, Facebook and live, um, what do you call it, LinkedIn and YouTube, and all of those have recordings. So you can come back and listen uh, if you have to go or, or miss any parts of it. Uh, right, so where are you? Well, you're here at the Squirrel Squadron, That's uh, and I'm Douglas Squirrel, your host, So and everybody calls me Squirrel, so just call me that. The Squirrel Squadron is my community of tech and non-tech people learning together. And uh, what we're learning about today is going to be artificial intelligence, the topic du jour. Everybody's uh, talking and arguing and debating about it. So uh, we're going to get onto that in just a moment. I'll just say that uh, if you're interested in uh, topics like this, uh, discussing what's happening not only in the headlines, but in your tech team, how to help your tech be more profitable, uh, you can check it out on squirrelsquadron.com. We have events like this every week. They're always free. Everything in the squadron is free. It's my way of giving back. And uh, we have events. We have a forum where people are discussing interesting topics. We had a great debate on outsourcing recently, a lot of really interesting points of view. Um, we had uh, we have a wonderful question from someone I think is here. I, I owe an answer to uh, on uh, what AI is going to do to the workplace. We're, we're probably not going to get into that with Dan today, but great discussions on relevant topics. Uh, what um, discussions are coming up soon? Well, I'm in Krakow talking about why you don't need Scrum in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're doing more free events on uh, disappointing people, for example, why, for example, why that's helpful, why it's a good idea to disappoint people. Um, so all about how to manage your team, how to deal with your tech team, how to have better conversations. Uh, last ground rule is you must ask questions. You must say why you're here. Uh, this is going to be an interesting no holds barred debate with Dan, who I'll introduce in a moment. But uh, it's going to be much, much better. All of these events always are if you ask questions and, and jump in in the chat. We can see you. Um, this isn't one where you can speak up, but uh, we can speak up uh, with your keyboard um, and uh, let us know what you think about the topics. Argue with us, uh, discuss it. I'd love to hear if you're here and uh, interested and are willing. Uh, throw in the chat what brought you here, what made you interested, why did you think this was a, a topic that you wanted to talk about. Fantastic. So, uh, Dan, uh, wonderful to have you with us. Uh, Dan, I met at a, an event called the Nerd Forum, which is uh, loads of fun. It's exactly what you think it is, a bunch of nerds getting together, but not all technically minded nerds, nerds of the creative fields, nerds uh, who run businesses, nerds who uh, are interested in these topics. And we were having a, about an hour's discussion of you know, why Midjourney was going to change the world. And I had ideas for how it would help my wife and uh, what ChatGPT was all about and how we were going to change uh, technology with it. And Dan pipes up and says, I think it's going to kill all of us. And uh, that completely changed the discussion. And I thought that he was so articulate and thoughtful and helpful. Uh, and I disagreed with him so strongly uh, that it would be an interesting discussion to have. So, Dan, uh, I don't know you. We haven't set this up ahead of time. I just said, Dan, come talk to us. You were so good um, in the event. So uh, would you introduce us? I don't think I can do you justice. Uh, tell us who you are, where you came from, um, and what you do all day. Sure. Thanks very much for having me on. It's always nice to be invited on a debate where someone introduces you, at least in what you wrote on Twitter and a few other places, as being completely wrong from the outset. So thank you for, for being so open-minded. Um, Indeed. I'm, well, you I'm may convince me. Keep going. Uh, yeah, 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 well, I'm, I'm hoping to be convinced the other way. It would help me sleep at night if I were indeed I wrong. I bet. Um, so I started a company called Farewell about seven and a half years ago, and we work on changing the way the world deals with death. We started out in wills. We're the biggest will writer in the UK. We now have a sort of large probate and funeral business as well. So kind of compared to the traditional sector, it's very old fashioned and high street based. We do everything online, cheaper, simpler and overall better. And um, so we're a team about 70 based in London, raised a bunch of venture capital and, 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 and that sort of thing. Obviously not what I'm here to talk about today, but I will, I will not claim to be an expert about AI at all. Um, which I said when we were at the event as well. I also, I also want to uh, caveat your introduction that I, I don't think we're all going to die because of AI, but I think that there is a, 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 a meaningful risk that it could cause catastrophic, um, it could have catastrophic um, uh, implications for humankind 
in several different fascinating ways. So I very much hope that I'm wrong. And, and I also think it's worth saying from the outset, I'm incredibly excited about the future of AI. I think it has huge promise for, for um, massive positive transformation of society as well. And in general, I'm, I'm uh, a big advocate of technology and, and I'm not someone who gets worried about existential risks facing uh, civilization. So, so I think I just want to add in those few caveats of, in general, I'm a hugely optimistic pro-technology person. I actually am both of those things for AI, but I also think that it comes with huge untold risk that at the moment isn't covered properly in the debate, although it's starting to be a little more. Fantastic. Well, I'm very interested to hear about that, but I just want to say two things. One is uh, we, I didn't invite you here because you were an expert. I invited you here because you had that um, very pragmatic approach. So, um, you know, a lot of people are have just, they're zealots. They've really kind of decided their point of view. They haven't considered anything else. They're, um, uh, they're trying to convince you, and they, they also want you to know about their latest theories on vaccines or climate change or something else. They, ha they have a, an ax to grind. And um, at least I got the sense that you didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to change the world by deleting all uh, instances of chat GPT. That's not how you think. And, and I thought that was a great element. That's the sort of person we want in this world squadron. That's the sort of debate and discussion we want. People who are considering what the heck we do with these technologies and, and why people seem to use them so wrongly. So that's, one, that's why I'm really glad you're here. And I think this is going to be really interesting. The other thing I want to do before I, I'm going to let you kind of give your case as you did so well at the forum um, and I'll let you start. Uh, but um, uh, just tell us there's an interesting connection between having got started helping people with their wills and helping them kind of face death more effectively. And the idea that AI is, is a risk. Um, I wonder, is there any connection between those two? How, how did you get to um, looking into wills uh, and, and helping people with those? Um, I got into that. So I went to the, I studied engineering at university and then I went to um, uh, the Royal College of Art and I spent a couple of years. What a in, combination. Thanks. And then I spent a couple of years in, in Tokyo and New York. And while I was working in Japan, I, I focused on geriatric care. Um, the type of design I've always been drawn to rather than it being the purely aesthetic side of things, it's sort of tricky human problem solving. And whilst I was working on that, I thought, uh, you know, we only focused on the physical side of aging rather than the fact that, that, you know, people were terrified of dying. They had no way of dealing with it. They didn't have their friends or family around. And when I came back to the UK, UK, I spent a couple of months in the death industry purely out of curiosity. And, and I thought, now, what do you mean by the death industry? I could think of several meanings. Um, uh, funerals and wills and probates, learning as much as I could about it. Um, and I ended up thinking, wow, you know, this is basically the biggest consumer market that's been untouched not just by technology but by any kind of customer centricity it looks and feels like something from the 14th century or whatever like your house is um so 15th century um so so for me it's just a really interesting combination of, of a kind of very untouched market and also something that there's there's a uh, an experiment that was done, I think, in the 70s called the Holmes and Ra stress scale. It rates everything that you can go through in your life out of 100 in terms of basically how awful it is. The thing that scores 100 is the death of a spouse, a parent, or a best friend. So you have this interesting crossover of, of basically the worst thing that you can ever deal with combined with a huge lack of innovation and forward thinking from the sector itself. And to me, that's kind of what gets me going. I think there were a thread between what I do and between uh, and, and uh, my interest in AI. Um, I like thinking about the future and I like thinking about, um, you know, the impact of our decisions today on, on what happens down the road. I've always been kind of drawn to that. So naturally, I think I gravitated to, right, well, what's the, what are some of the logical ends to the chess game that we've started playing recently? Fascinating. Okay, I'll just say one more thing about wills, and then uh, then I'll we'll go into the AI. Um, my wife and I have a very interesting provision in our will, which I think gives gives another perspective that it is something that I think is really good about our will, which is that we're giving away this house. So the house that we live in, which is um, six hundred years old, as you were kind enough to mention, um, is, is when people come to visit, they paint it. You know, they go and, and uh, draw pictures and take pictures of it and things. And, and so we think it's an important, valuable asset. So we have an opportunity when we're no longer here to do something good with our will. So yeah. um, I just think that forward thinking is a very positive thing. So it's, it's both terrifying and yeah. a wonderful opportunity. So great, yeah. great combination. 
good stuff. And you're Great. leaving it to the kind of Heritage Foundation or something. Exactly, yeah, National Trust. So uh, they will Fantastic. Good for, in, good for inheritance and... tax as well. <laughs> exactly. So you know, all kinds of good things happen for us and other people. And, uh, you know, that, that's uh, if you can get over the fear, it's helpful. Right. Yeah. So AI is also something that scares people. And mm -hmm. um, you have a, a, a very interesting and uh, contrarian view to how a lot of people are looking at ChatGPT. You know, my, my, my niece is complaining that it's um, uh, that her uh, uh, university colleagues are using it to cheat. Uh, I think you have some bigger concerns. Tell us what, what concerns yeah. you. Yeah, definitely. So, so, I mean, just to give some context to, to, to why this came up. So the Nerd Forum is a kind of group of technology executives been going since 2014, I think. And we had a meeting about um, a kind of quarterly meetup and the focus was about AI. And I thought, okay, fascinating. Great. I've been really interested in this for the last year. I've got increasingly concerned about it. And and I thought, what a great forum for to, to discuss it. And then I was really surprised that the agenda was pretty much focused on, you know, interesting things that you can do with AI when it comes to gaming and artwork. And I thought, this is crazy. It's like, it's like we're in the middle of the Manhattan Project and we're talking about how you can like microwave a baked potato with it. So, so um, I think there are a few really fascinating things about the development, particularly in the last couple of years of, of uh, what's been happening with chat, GPT and other LLMs, where... Um, LLM of... is large language model for people who don't know. Keep going. So, so a couple of interesting things have happened that are relatively unusual in technology. So, so one is, and you know, there's, there was this open letter that basically said, pump the brakes on, on AI. That's fairly unprecedented in the history of technology. And to have people who are on the forefront of technology, who are advocates for the positive impact that it can have, saying pump the brakes is pretty unusual, worth taking note of. Um, the other one is that there is an active correlation between people who are knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the subject and people who are worried about it. Whereas in most kind of crazy tinfoil hat type things, there's a correlation between people who really don't understand what's going on and people who think that it's incredibly dangerous. So both of those things, I think, are good cause for, for, for people who aren't necessarily on in, inside the, the, uh, the, the loop of the potential dangers of it to, to kind of sit up and say, right, is there something going on here? Um, I think for anyone who's used chat GPT uh, and particularly GPT-4, um, it is an unbelievably powerful tool, even without much modification. The, uh, and I use it m multiple times a day, have built things with it. And I really am enjoying using it. It's incredibly powerful. Um, I'd say in my lifetime, it's the, it's the most impressive, surprising uh, technological leap forwards of anything I've, I've experienced. Wow. Can I ask you a question about that? It, you, you, I can't tell how old you are, but I have the guess that you might have, you might be able to remember a time before the internet when, when people didn't buy things on Amazon and so on. Is that true? I'm 30, so I'm, I'm 32. Uh, so, okay. so, you know, I, I, I was born in 1990. Um, I remember my dad getting the first Macintosh computer. That was pretty impressive. Like playing dot, dot to dot with uh, on that was 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 fairly amazing but a lot of this stuff has been fairly incremental obviously if you've been inside those ai communities this seems more incremental but you've got massive public adoption of really an incredibly powerful uh, tool that's a good point so so what i was going to compare to was the advent of the internet and i remember when i first ordered something online and it came and i thought wow this this is really going to change how people buy stuff and now, yeah. you know, I can't remember the last time I went to a shop, you know, like a hardware store or something, because you buy everything online. Mm -hmm. And that that came on very suddenly for some people. I was inside it. So I was in the tech world and working with uh, computers. So I saw some of it and it wasn't as surprising, but it was really shocking to many people. But what you're saying is one thing that is particularly outstanding about this technological innovation is that we've adopted it in a couple of months, whereas it took maybe two or three or five years for it really to permeate the idea that you could download movies and you could um, buy books and so on. I think is that what genuine, you're saying? I think it's a genuine radical transformation. You had mail order catalogs before. Essentially, you had a mail order catalog online and something turned up at your door when you started mm -hmm. buying stuff online in the first place. So, so it was a kind of incremental uh, shift in, in how something worked, but it wasn't you know, I, I, I don't think it's in the same kind of ballpark of, uh, as, as, as what we've seen in the last kind of year of the development of AI. Also, I think another interesting thing that's worth noticing is, is um, and a lot of what we were talking about at the event was, um, so, so I, I don't really know how to structure this argument because I'm not even really trying to make an argument in the first place. I just think that, I think if I was to, to, to land one particular point, 
it's that I think this has the the potential for untold um, uh, negative consequences. And the balance of investment in understanding the technology is is right now 99% on on the pedal to, met, to the metal side of things and 1% on on the seatbelt end. And and I'd, I I really think that that, that, that should uh, shift in the other direction in in order that we can mitigate the potential for for great harm. So so that that's that's my point I'm trying to make overall. Not that we should completely stop this or anything. Um, a lot of the conversation. And, and can you tell us about those harms? What what are some examples yeah. of the harms? Because people who are listening may may or may not be aware of what what people are thinking about could happen and what could go wrong. Yeah. So 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 this is a bit where other people will talk much more eloquently and at, at, at greater length in more technical detail. Don't do yourself me. down. You're you're brilliant. Go ahead. Thank you. Um. So I think there's a few different stages of it. Um. There is the first stage that we're in at the moment, which is completely. Uh, is, is happening today where I think we're going to see a massive proliferation of, well, actually, we're already past the first stage of this, which is um, comprehensive adoption of AI in term, into mainly social media tools. So if you think about, we, we could say, how can AI ever you know, take over humanity? Or how can AI really influence humanity? Well, people watch five hours of TikTok a day in lots of countries around the world. Teenagers aged 12 to 18 are watching five hours of TikTok per day, the, the most recent studies into it are, are not, which is what was expected from the outset, that AI helps you to find the content that you're interested in and double down on it. It's much more that AI is influencing the type of content that people are interested in. So already today, a massive proportion of the waking hours of the future of the entire earth are dictated by an AI that no one knows what's going on inside the hood of an AI. So, so I think yeah, what you're saying there is, is TikTok specifically is using an AI to determine what um, uh, video you see next. And precisely. Facebook does the same, and Google yeah. does the same with Google Search, and Microsoft yeah. does it with Bing, and so on. Okay, yeah, people exactly. may not be aware of that, but that that is yeah. certainly true. And I, I'm by no means a neuroscientist, but I really do believe that people's mental health is affected by spending time on on stuff like TikTok for the entire time that our dopamine systems are out of whack, that it overall is just doing unpredictable, strange things to, to the generation of people who are growing up at the moment. So, so I think we've already lost the first battle of we've created something that we don't know how it's working. It's taking a massive amount of human um, attention and potential. So, so you, could, you could debate that, but I, I, I kind of err towards the side of the line, which is like, this is weird and bad. And if I had a kid, I wouldn't want them on TikTok the whole time. I think and not going... only TikTok, but also we have uh, people influencing elections and promoting the kinds of tinfoil hat theories we were denigrating a moment ago. We have yeah. some pretty negative things that are happening. The thing I'd say about that is those were happening in 2010. So I agree those are bad things, yeah. but those yeah. feel more like they've been kind of gradually coming on. We've observed them. We're, we're doing mm. something about them as a society. I'm sure we could do a lot more. Yeah, but those don't seem incremental and sudden and dangerous in the way I, I think some of your other harms might be. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think that the manpower it has taken in the past to have a reasonably sophisticated disinformation campaign is is significant. Um, and and um, and the sophistication you need pretty much yeah. to be a nation state to use the really sophisticated yeah. tools to influence a, a major country election. Exactly. So, so I think these tools East, might make it much easier. Like in, exactly. So it's massively reducing the the barrier to this to controlling this sort of disinformation. And um, in East Germany, at one point, to run a regime was it the Stasi? Is that the is Stasi? That the, that's right. Yep. Uh, Stasi in East Germany, which basically controlled the entire media, controlled the entire population. They employed twenty percent of the population of East Germany in order to carry that out. So, so yeah, you know, you, you've always been able to do this stuff, but if one in five people has to be, has to be in the loop, then that's a fairly big observable um, uh, factor. So, so some, some different thought experiments that are interesting at the moment. So, so um, WhatsApp, let's so, 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 um, let me couch this in something that I find really interesting, which is that most people find it difficult to anticipate uh, exponential increases in, in anything. I, I find it difficult to, 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 to truly under, understand exponentiality. I think most people, it's just like counterintuitive. 
Even there's a the... wonderful lecture, um, which I'll put on the forum after this. Um, help me remember. I'm going to ask Laura, who's watching us, our, our community manager, to help me remember. There's an absolutely wonderful lecture, if I can find it, that just illustrates all this and shows you just how uh, un unaware people are of something that grows exponentially. Because it grows yeah. incredibly slowly at first. That's the thing that yeah. fools you, is it goes very slow, and then it takes off. And it, it looks like it's just taking over instantly, and it's an instant transition. So exactly. you're, you're so, arguing that this is this is going to be an exponential transition. What, what's going to transition? Well, so so I think this this is kind of doubly exponential in a way. The it has the potential. I believe it logically has the potential to have two kinds of exponentiality to it. Where you could say mushrooms growing in a forest have an exponential growth pattern. But sure, you know, every year they double in size. So if they were left untouched for a hundred years, it would, you know, control the whole surface of the earth or something, but it's slow and you can react to it and the rest of it. The, the in, improvement in computational power, and I would in a way, and me and you debated this in the event, intelligence, as far as I'm concerned, is improving exponentially. I think you reach, you, it's totally logic, logically possible as far as I'm concerned for that intelligence to unlock further gains in the power of those models themselves or in the underlying computing hardware that allows it to not be rate limited like the growth of a mushroom is. So you can have this exponential improvement, but that then is reinforced and it allows it to, you know, what people have called for a long time, the technology singularity, which is the idea that, you know, me and you are here chatting about chat GPT, about uh, GPT-4, and then in, in, in six months time, we'll be like, oh my God, GPT-5 is, is mind blowing. And then in a year's time, we'll be like, wow, GPT-6 has really changed the nature of society. And then we'll be like, wow, and chat GPT, set, boom, lights out. Everyone's like chained to a radiator by a bunch of robot, robots. Um, so, so I know that's- so, I know so Let's that's, slow that down because that, yeah. that may not make sense to everybody listening if they're not following this. Uh, I, yeah. I follow it, but, but let me just make sure I've heard it right. Yeah. So- what, what happens first in order to make that doubly exponential phenomenon happen is that you, you get the, the robots, you get the chat GPTs and the Bings and the Bards and all these wonderful two of the mid journeys in a state where they actually start modifying themselves. So mm -hmm. uh, we're not at that state yet, as far as I know. There's, there may be somebody out there who's, mod who's using chat GPT to update itself. But, yeah. but it's not it's not taking that we haven't hit the the the, the um, sharp part of that curve yeah but when that happens the argument is that then the computer moves so fast uh, it takes milliseconds for it to, to compute things and uh, whereas humans would take years to produce yeah. something like chat GPT and in fact they did that the chat you go to, to four and then five and then six seven eight nine ten and you're suddenly at an incredible rate yeah. of improvement yeah yeah Exactly, um, which to me just logically so, checks out. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so I don't, I don't think that that necessarily is. It's, it's not really a question that's debated very much. It's much more in the AI world a question of, um, of sort of when rather than if. I think there are limitations of okay, well, you could have a singularity of of something that was able to process unlimited information, but what is it? What is unlimited intelligence necessarily look like? Is it that much more powerful than our intelligence? And that's a really complicated question to answer. The thing that I'm was going to come back to that, I want to keep going, but I, I want to let you describe the harms. So, yeah, so, so, so we, we go to six, seven, eight, nine, and we suddenly at this great yeah. speed, but but then you got to, to robots suddenly vaporizing the, the, the planet. So I think that moves yeah, a little yeah. fast, so, help us out. Yeah, completely. So, so I think there's a couple of different stages of this. The first stage, which we're already in is that computers and AI have categorically proven that they can overpower human reasoning and rationale because people watch five hours of TikTok a day. So we already necessarily aren't able to achieve the goals that we would set ourselves because we're distractible in this way. Now, AI can another point out. I want to come back to, I just want to put a pin in it here. They had human help. So they were humans who, who assisted the computers in like getting yeah. onto phones and telling them about how phones worked and so on. So there, it's a human plus computer, something I call a centaur. It's a term from chess, where you get a human and a computer working together. But keep going. Yeah. I want yeah, to come so back to that. So the first ninety percent of what's terrifying about this is is to describe a centaur or centaur, so Cent, uh, whichever way you say. It, I'm not sure. I'm not Greek. It's a yeah. Greek mythological. Uh, it's yeah, like yeah, half yeah. horse, half human. But I never yeah, know quite so, how to so, say it right. Um, so the the centaur thing is is you know the first ninety percent of what's terrifying about this for sure. You know, this this has the potential instead of needing 20 percent of East Germany to work for the Stasi, 
for a small group of people to to carry out massive disinformation, disinformation or, or scam campaigns. Um, if you take something like, and, and one of the things that is talked about a lot at the moment is cybersecurity, where people who work in cybersecurity are like, if we think that, that cyber threats in the past have been an issue of national security or even just personal security, shit is about to hit the fan in a really serious way. This is like Indeed. really off the charts in terms of what you can do. Um, you know, I have you... A, a client who uh, runs the largest lesbian dating app in the world, and I'm warning them to uh, look out for catfishing like you've never, you could never believe. Yeah, this, yeah. This yeah, yeah. Incredible, perfect images, perfect com conversation, romance yeah. scams like uh, 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 unbelievable. Keep going. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So, 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 one thing that's really scary is is the breakdown of um, of uh, a kind of modern cryptographic techniques. Um, again, not my area of expertise, but uh, but can get scary. I think the phishing potential of of AI is is enormous. You know, in terms of fake voice calls, all the different types of things that you can do to scrape data from one place or another, to build a profile of someone, to convince them that they're speaking to their bank manager or a friend of theirs, is possible today. Very possible today. From this recording someone could produce a completely passable fake of my face in my kitchen with my voice telling anyone to do anything. That, that's possible now, and they can even do it in real time. You could be essentially wearing my, my face like a hat and speaking in real time to anyone that you wanted to. You could call my brother, you could call the farewell, you could call our, our, our main company phone line, convince yeah. them it was me, say we need to why are all this. my well, why are all our money here you know yeah. the, the bank is so, about to collapse which so, is a realistic so, scenario right some people were doing that a few weeks ago so yeah exactly if so, they so, were so convincing that it was you that somebody might do it totally there was an example the other day of someone who called up uh somebody's mom and basically said look we've kidnapped your daughter and you need to transfer us fifty thousand dollars or something like that and they put yep. the daughter on the phone and she was like i'm so scared i'm so afraid it sounded exactly yeah. like them. They only found out that it was a complete scam just when someone called and said, your daughter is here. Is Somebody else. actually phoned the daughter where she was. Yeah, yeah I read this. So, that, so that's today. We have, we, have, we have passed that point categorically. For anyone who has any sort of public presence, which is everybody who is 15 to 30, um, they're, they're irreparably, like irretrievably fucked in terms of being able to impersonate both their face and their voice. And if you take something like WhatsApp, for instance, Let's say you've got access to someone's WhatsApp account, or you, you if, I mean, on a worse scale of this is if cryptography breaks down, but if you somehow got the login details of someone's WhatsApp through phishing, what you have then is you have access to huge amounts of text conversations with everyone they know, which allows you to talk in the way that people communicate with their family and their friends, the rest of it. You have pictures of the people who are involved, which allows you to realistically, you know, with mid journey in a, in a second, you know, uh, uh, create an image of someone anywhere doing, saying anything. You can create videos with that. And you can also, if they've sent voice notes, uh, perfectly impersonate someone's voice saying anything that you'd want to. So the potential to surround someone with disinformation, you know, imagine that you suddenly got a call from your partner, from your best friend, from four people you worked with in the past saying, there is some serious shit going on and you need to get out of the country right now. Or, there is gonna be a massive run on the banks and you have to withdraw all of your money. Like this is really, really scary times for, for the first phase of this, which is Centaur uh, uh, disinformation um, uh, campaigns. We know that there are uh, governments or groups that are interested in doing these sorts of things. And they've suddenly gone from bringing a spoon to the knife fight to having an AK-47 in, in terms of speed, complexity, sophistication of their tools. So. So um, funny enough, just before I was on the call, I was, I was on the phone to the woman who's the chair of Stop Scams UK, who I've known for a while, um, and have like chatted to her about a couple of different things, being like, you have to massively, massively up your uh, technological um, uh, understanding of, of these types of scams, because there's going to be there are going to be 100 new scams a day to keep track of rather than, oh, there's this one and we need to con get in contact with the Royal Mail to do postage fees or whatever. This is about to get really scary. Indeed. And I'll just yeah. say one thing, because I actually did study number theory and I, there's a certain amount of cryptography I know. Don't worry too much about the cryptography. That that part is reasonably well handled, reasonably well worked on. And there's no reason to believe that the computer's absent massive singularity changes are yeah. going to be able to do it, even if they become this sort of super intelligence. Um, but uh, what you, we should really worry about is everything you just said, 
because it's so much easier to get somebody's password by having four <laughs> friends phone them and say, um, you know, the, the, yeah. there's this government scheme. They'll give you a hundred dollars if you um, tell them your password. Um, you know, go to the website now, and it's your best friend, and you don't know very much about tech, and you need a hundred dollars. That's the kind of thing that you know I just thought up in ten seconds right now that exactly. people are going to do all over the place because it is so trivial to do. And, okay, and so we my understanding of it on the cryptography side of things as well. But then you know even if you take an organization that and like you're saying about your friend running this this dating website, you know someone has access to uh, lots of information inside the company who's uh, who's let's say their VP of engineering. Like that person is fishable for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, or so, threatenable. Yeah. The one thing I used to worry about when I uh, ran uh, tech for a um, startup that had both financial data and kids data, we did kids finances and so the yeah. toxic mix, right? We had really important stuff. I worried about um, somebody in that in those days actually physically kidnapping someone yeah. and then threatening my system admin and saying, you know, give me all the information right now or, you know, if something happens to your, your friend here. Yeah. But you can do that without actually having to kidnap anyone. That's the yeah. thing that's worrying. So we're yeah. agreed there. There's very serious harms from centaurs. Yeah. So, so us, we, we haven't got to the robots vaporizing the earth yet. Tell us okay. more about that. Okay. So, so battle number one we've lost, which is AI plus a human can distract people and get them to do stuff with their life that no one would have anticipated. No one set out saying, I want to watch five hours of videos a day of like people baking cakes or like putting slime down a toilet or something. Um, so, so we've already lost the first battle. Second battle we're agreed on, which is, the potential for major personal harm and also for for kind of company disinformation and and and, and phishing um so so that one seems pretty scary um the third one is is kind of governmental level disinformation campaigns where you could for instance cause a run on a bank if you were sophisticated enough to plan something like that so so i think you could cause really serious um uh uh, kind of strange changes in behavior inside a, a, a nation state, which could massively disrupt how it works. I, I don't even know what those examples are, but I think that they, they probably are pretty scary. You have to be pretty um, evil to think up the real ones that will actually come. But but yeah. we, us non-evil people, we can kind of anticipate. Yep, yeah, I'm with you there. So, so to whatever level you believe that there's been some kind of, you know, government interference, or, or it isn't government, government interference. I think that's the funny thing. It's just, it's just, it's just campaigning. You know, people campaigning for a particular political party. Suddenly, again, instead of bringing a spoon to the knife fight, they've got an AK-47. If they know how to use this stuff properly, it's incredible how powerful it is. The next U.S. election is going to be very, very interesting. Yeah. Not yeah. necessarily in a good way. Totally, totally. So so, so that's pretty scary. Um, and it's it's fascinating how individual people's experience of information is. Like I said to my, my brother's a music producer, and I was saying to him, ah, oh, you... Oh, I mentioned a musician to him. I was like, you must have seen this guy. I don't even have, I don't have any social media. I honestly don't. I occasionally watch videos on YouTube, not because I don't like this stuff, but because it is so addictive. I'm an, I'm an, I have an addictive personality. And once I start, I just YouTube. can't stop. Yep. So, so I, I, I have to, to I have to like cold turkey it. I said to my brother, oh, you must have heard of this guy. He's everywhere. Every time I switch on, he's absolutely everywhere. All of the biggest artists are like copying his song. My brother's like, I've literally never heard of this guy. And my brother's a music producer, does pop music day in, day out. So and this is my brother. I talk to him basically every day. And we have a completely different worldview of what is important in terms of society and, and what's going on in the, in the kind of cultural zeitgeist. So that's quite interesting. Um, so then to go, you know, a few steps down the road, there's a lot of the conversation, which is that kind of um, uh, Luddite narrative of this is going to put people out of work. I have to say that one is more of an unknown quantity for me, but I think that uh, it still is scary. I, I, I still think that that, as it always has, posed a certain risk to, to the stability of different, um, of, of society itself. And I keep on trying to figure out, is it actually a different type of technical innovation to the loom, you know? And I think it is. I think it is in the, you know, I've, I've, a friend who runs a company, there's 300 people who work in customer service. They started experimenting with AI. Two weeks later, 150 of them were made redundant. And I'm pretty sure the other 150 are going to be made redundant. They, they experimented with it for two weeks. And wow. the satisfaction scores, the customer satisfaction scores were through the roof. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you see amazing papers on, and this stuff you can take in any direction, but in terms of outperforming 
doctors in terms of diagnoses. So you're taking fields that are really specialist and you're starting to have AI and it's in its infancy at the moment that's outperforming top professionals. There's a great one on spotting brain tumors. And this was even, this is way before even GPT-3, just, uh, just uh, kind of machine reading images and using AI to basically say, does this person have a tumor or not? The AI beat the um, doctors, the, the, beat the panel of the best brain surgeons in the world in, term, in, in the world in terms of identifying whether or not people had tumors. So, so yeah, this so, can so be- Let me say something about that and it's actually relevant to Sophia's question. Sophia's here. Sophia asked this great question on the forum, which a few people have answered and I'm, I'm gonna give my answer, but I'll, I'll say something about it now, which is directly relevant to this, which is her question was, how is this gonna transform the workplace? What will the workplace look like? I think she's interested because she's working on some, some changes uh, and some tools that might help people with that. And the thing that strikes me is those brain surgeons aren't going to lose their jobs. I don't think we're going to, we may need fewer, we may need to train fewer brain surgeons, but what's going to happen is what happened in chess, which is that um, computers became this uh, huge asset to people to become better, to become centaurs. And uh, for the brain surgeons, I, I think they're doing okay because we still, we're not going to have the machines do the surgery anytime soon. I don't think yeah. maybe we'll get there, but we're not there yet. Um, but um, evaluating the tumors with a brain surgeon standing there saying, well, actually, I know that's a shadow and it's fooling the computer. But, man, it found this thing that I would never have found. Mm. That's really, really valuable and disruptive, but not going to knock out anybody's job. The example you gave of firing half the staff because uh, they're doing a routine task. I think that's the ones where we're really going to have trouble. I, I have clients who do uh, things like um, uh, interpret what people have scribbled at the side of the road when they're filing a police report um, on a motor accident. And the insurance company, of course, is very interested in what people wrote at the time, but it's raining and it's, you know, their handwriting's terrible and so on. And it can make out much better, much better than a human, what somebody wrote. And that's really mm. valuable to insurance companies. And there are human armies of humans who do that, who um, should look for new work. So I'm also with you here. Yeah. We're agreeing more than I expected, which is great. But we haven't we haven't got to vaporizing the earth yet. I know you're going to yeah. get there. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I thought so I thought we'd agree on that. And and you know, yes. how exciting! You know, anyone who's ever waited any period of time for an operation or a diagnosis is not going to be listening to listening to us having this conversation, thinking, "Oh my God, now I'm going to get a higher fidelity diagnosis faster than I would have done before." No, let's shut this down. Like that's yeah. obviously amazing. It has the it has a benefit. Like I said right from the beginning, for massive improvements in society. There was a great TED talk that I think came out today or yesterday from, oh, what's his name? The guy who runs a Khan Academy about AI hmm. in education. Yes. I haven't got a chance to watch that yet. I'll put that in the, in the forum post. Keep going. It's, it's really inspiring and worth watching. It gives it, oh, it great. totally levels the playing field in terms of access to one-on-one um, -on -one tuition type learning environment, which is, let's face it, for me, for loads of other people, learning in a classroom is just not the way to do it. And there's a great example right at the beginning of that talk of, the distribution of educational outcomes by whether you're in a classroom environment, like small group environment or tutored, and you can just move up the average outcomes by two standard deviations by having that kind of one on one interaction. And already today, it's so good with their with their uh, sort of one on one learning AI, you know, you put in an answer, and it will tell you why it's wrong and how to think about it differently or ask you to explain your reasoning. So, so that's fantastic. I mean, how exciting to be able to give everyone really world class education. Um, so the caveat fantastic. is it sometimes lies to you, but we've got used to that with Wikipedia. So um, we, yeah. we can learn. We, humans plus computers can manage so do that. Teachers. You know, so, so do teachers. Wow. They're, they're exactly. Um, People manage to deal with that. My dog's excited about it. I'll just say one more thing, which is uh, Jessa has asked, um, what kind of mitigations are there? Jessa, I'm going to do my best to make sure we get there, but I want to yeah. let Dan fin finish telling us about some of the dangers, but we'll, we'll talk yeah, about so, mitigations if we can. So, so I think this is, where, this is where it gets much more difficult to describe in concrete terms. And, and, and it, you can stay into territory of sounding like you're a bit crazy when you start to talk about this stuff, because they're mainly sort of thought experiments. And there's a few different uh, famous ones that it's worth talking about. Um, so the, uh, the way I think about this is, is, um, I definitely think a good description of, of intelligence is, is processing information. And the funny thing about the definition of, of, of sort of, um, artificial general intelligence, which is the point that people have always talked about in the past is like, okay, this isn't scary until we get to AGI because AGI is is the turning point of now humans are smarter than machines. Uh, sorry, machines are smarter than humans. So 
I think we've struggled in the past to define that point of AGI. And there's begun to be a debate inside the AI community of maybe we've already passed it. And and the thing is, we, we, and, we and think the point about, there is the, the word general. It's it's the, the, the idea yeah. is whatever it is you're building can do many different tasks, can can yeah. come to a task that's never touched before and work with it. And we've noticed that ChatGPT can kind of do that to, to some extent. Yeah. Go ahead. Precisely. Precisely. So, so, so I think... Um, a lot of the the so at the at the event that we were at there was a conversation which is really funny saying well GPT the, the, these kind of um, generative uh, algorithms have been really bad at, at rendering a hand that has five fingers on it and often they'll have six fingers on it and people are saying you know I think we don't have to worry for now because the hands have six fingers on them and and my point my understanding there is is imagine there's a great um, what's that thing called that comic thing that's like xcx or xkcd yeah xkcd there's a there's a good one on ai and it's but I, I think that i know it's or, or maybe it's not something else i haven't think about it it's basically let's say there are worms over here on this sort of intelligent spectrum and then a few steps up the ladder there are humans and, and right now we are we are the apex predator when it comes to intelligence and and um they're, they're, they're totally logically could be something that was significantly more intelligent than a human in terms of its ability to process information, to find things out, research things. So right now we're trying to build a prison, a way of controlling a type of intelligence that could be the same, if not a thousand times greater, the difference between, an between a worm and us. And our definition. So we're the worms, and they're, 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 uh, yeah, exactly. the the hypothesis is the computer so, could so, become so, the the human. Yep, it could become the. the problem the, is it's very difficult. To, it's very difficult to conceive of something that is a hundred times more intelligent than yourself. So, so a, but certainly a worm, a worm would have trouble putting a human in prison. Exactly. So a worm would think about intelligence in terms of oh, you know, can it uh, dig a hole in the right direction? I don't know what worms spend their time on, but but they probably think, hey, I'm you know. We worms want to dig holes to find some bananas or whatever it is. Um, that probably isn't what they do. But but we think about intelligence. Oh, you know, can it can it solve this particular thing, or is it capable of a type of thought that I actually think is quite human? Whereas can, can it put already, five fingers on a hand? Exactly. And it's like, who cares if you can put five fingers on a hand? This thing is trained on the sum total of all information in the entire world ever up until 2021. All research papers that are publicly accessible all types of conversation between different people. It has access at lightning speed to the sum total of human knowledge, understanding, discourse, debate, politics, psychology at its fingertips and is able to work at a, 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 a kind of bus rate of a trillion times what any human is, is capable of. And if you plug it into the right kind of computational hardware, which is still improving pretty fast each year, it has the biggest nuclear reactor powered brain with access to all information ever, it's obviously gonna be so much more intelligent and it arguably is than humans today. So, so a lot of the conversation is, well, how do we build the right guardrails to be able to control something so intelligent? And I find that a terrifying discussion because how would worms build a prison for a human? I think they'd have a pretty difficult time. Got it. Okay. So let me, let me, now that we've got kind of the picture, let me, let me just finish what I think your, your kind of end state is. The, the end state, if I understand it right, is we, we get to this level of um, uh, quantum level above worms of, of uh, ability, I'll say, because I want to come back yeah. to intelligence. And we get to that and we plug it into itself and it suddenly gets yeah. to version two, version three, version five, version six, seven, eight, nine, and it suddenly is taking off. It, it, it hits a singularity. And it's it, it has a, a purpose which is not necessarily aligned with humans. That doesn't have to be a negative purpose. The classic example is it might be really interested in making paper clips because the people who happen to build it work in a paper clip factory and that's what they ask the computer to help them do. And because it is so super intelligent because it's so super able, uh, it produces tons and tons of paper clips and eventually it um, uh, takes over the earth and mines all the iron in order to make more and more paper clips. Yeah, that's a, a, a intentionally um, outrageous example, but it's the sort yeah. of thing that I think is the end state of what what you're arguing, Dan. Is that right? Absolutely, and and it's really interesting because I've never been very into sci-fi, but the more I got interested in this debate, you start to realize the kind of the brilliance of some sci-fi books and films where they've actually yeah, they've they anticipated this. Out. They've played yeah. out this game of strategic chess, and they've actually been really thoughtful. And I, I said to a friend the other day. 
this is going to get me in trouble, but I was, I was thinking, I, I really got so worried about this. I was like, maybe the best thing I can do is literally fly around the world and personally murder everyone who's like in leading the field in AI, because I think this is so troubling. And they were like, oh, just like in Terminator, but I haven't even seen Terminator. So obviously, so which is funny that I haven't seen it. And I'm not going to murder anyone, just 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 for the record here. Yeah, don't worry, Dan. It's perfectly nice and friendly. There's nothing nothing to worry yeah, about from yeah. Dan. Uh, that's, the that's AI he works with, maybe maybe not. That's how worried okay. I was about it. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think the question is, is a real misconception of like the robots are evil and they want to eat our brains? No, the robots aren't evil. The robots just don't care about us. You know, we don't care about the worms. Maybe we'll be subjugated and live in servitude to our like incredibly intelligent worm overlords, but maybe they'll just destroy us all because we're pointless. So almost whatever, whatever instruction you give it. So there's two steps to this. One is try and think of an instruction that you could give an incredibly powerful AI that wouldn't kill everyone in the world. It's very hard. It's really hard to do that. Um, then, and you can be the most menial thing ever. And, and you know, lots of examples are like, oh, solve climate change. Well, yeah, solve climate change, just kill everyone. Um, and so that's one point. Or just cool, it. cool down the earth. That would be good. Let's make it cold. And then lots of yeah. people are cold. And that's not very good yeah. for humans. It's a very simple example. Uh, the, totally. the possibility so, so for think, misinterpretation. You know, that's one step of it, which is, and that still assumes we're in control of the robot here, that we're putting in an instruction that it carries out. I think it's easy to imagine that these types of, that, that, that it could generate an instruction for itself. I don't that's think that's- that's where the, the worry comes. This it generates its own instruction. It, yeah. The instruction includes improve yourself and therefore you get this, yeah. excellent, this kind of runaway um, uh, feedback loop. Okay. Exactly. I, exactly. I've got the argument there. Let, let me just zero in on something which we discussed at the forum that didn't get fully through, and and we may run over a little bit. I don't know how you're fixed for time, but just tell me when okay. you need to go. But this is this is exciting. Um, the uh, um, uh, the thing we focused on and I zeroed in on was this notion of intelligence. We don't have a great definition, so I'm not going to sit here and I, I try to get wordsmith it to get the right definition. But it certainly strikes me as I use these tools, and I and I know something about how they're built under the hood, that I don't see intelligence there. I don't see that, for example, there's any reflection, that there's any ability to say, well, I thought this yesterday, and I think this today. I knew how to make paper clips at a certain speed yesterday, and I, I'm reflected on that, and now I'm going to make more paper clips today even more effectively. Yeah, That seems to be completely absent. And, and it's absent by design. The, the, if you just leave chat GPT alone, you don't type anything. It doesn't type anything back. There's no reflective activity going on there. And that seems like an inhal, in, in, inherent so, and important element of not only intelligence, but the ability to act in the world. So if chat GPT so is going to be the... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, so I think a couple, of, a couple of thought experiments that could provide a counter example there is... Great, what's please. The, what's, the, what's the feedback loop that you give it? So... So um, you can already have a conversation with GPT-4 and, and you'll say to it, this isn't the answer I was looking for. I was actually looking for more of this and it will go back and refine itself. And I, I don't know exactly how this is built, but I imagine that this is being trained. GPT-4 is being trained by a massive amount of interaction with it. So it is. So it is. And I can tell you that one. So, so what's happening is that it reads the, um, the transcript of what you've got so far, and it looks for whatever it can add to that transcript, that it looks the most yeah. convincing, that's most valuable. So the extent of its memory is just back to when you started that conversation. If you start another conversation tomorrow, and you say, what were you thinking about yesterday? I want to pick up our conversation and, and, and discuss what we were thinking about. And I want to know what you've come up with since then. What have you been thinking yeah. about? It doesn't have that. It's, it's not yeah, even sure. possible it's, to it's, have it. It's not programmed to do that. But it is possible to it's program not... it to do that. It is. You could get out. Well, you could go, I mean, you're saying, what did you learn yesterday versus today? If I had a conversation with it yesterday where I said to it, you know, whatever, come up with something. No, I don't think that's very good. I think this is better. It would start to be informed by all of its experience of interacting with humans. So sure. this is only so one you give it people. some way to go back and, and look at oh, its previous conversations. Exactly. But but what it doesn't do is is sit there and think about, you know, I did some thinking this afternoon. I just sat I in my chair and I thought, I and I came up with new that. ideas that I'll use. But you could it easily design it. You could design it to do that, theoretically. I don't see why that's impossible. I, I think we could have a long technical discussion on how you do that, which it's not the purpose of the conversation, so I won't go into it. But I think that's one place where I find it very hard to be convinced that we have a chain that leads to um, some of these harms. I totally buy it that 
we're going to have scams and we're going to have um, right. um, uh, people really tricked and, and misinformation everywhere. That I'm, I'm, I'm with you on. Where I okay, can't so, get so, so, is that we're going to have an intelligent thing that sits down and thinks, how could I attack the world? How could I do this? How could I achieve more paperclips? You just need to give it the prompt to reflect on what it's learned since you last interacted with it. And then it's a question of what are the feedback loops that you have in action? So let's say that you have, I mean, TikTok is an incredible example of it. It gets infinite feedback, well, not infinite, it gets a huge amount of feedback from everyone watching their videos the whole time. And the fascinating thing is it's now started influencing how content creators create their content. So, sure. so that's a really interesting form of feedback loop that is probably the, the kind of um, highest frequency feedback of, of any AI model that's existed in humanity is people watching videos. So do, do, you know about the crazy, do you know about the crazy baby videos? No. So no. There, there are these insane videos, which as far as anybody can tell, have just been generated in order to entertain babies, pre-verbal, no, no ability right. to speak at all. And, um, but they're videos that he, uh, adult humans don't understand. They're just kind of weird shapes and, wow. and ducks appear out of nowhere. And, but the um, people, now this is humans plus computers here, this isn't automated, but people have just refined what, what do babies click on? What gets a baby to keep yeah. watching? And if they yeah. can get that, they get money from YouTube. And, and I'm not sure an advertiser actually benefits, but maybe they do. Um, but, but there are these videos you can find which make no sense to an adult, but they've been produced yeah. by a feedback loop like this. So, so, so I think the question is, what, what is the feedback loop that you can give to an AI? And, and, and I think it's, it's um, uh, unimaginative to conceive of the fact that there couldn't be very dangerous feedback loops that allowed an AI to learn about, to, to learn about things which actually Interesting. Okay. Let me go to something slightly different and uh, just posit this to you. I'm, I'm going to argue for a moment that uh, we already have artificial intelligence and we've had it for thousands of years. The artificial intelligence I'm referring to is the first one is governments and the second one is corporations because those are assemblies of humans who have technological help, but you can think of the humans like the neurons and the assemblage of say the East India company or IBM has opinions and thoughts and takes actions. And I claim does some of the things that I was just saying these chat GPT models can't do. There's some reflection that happens. There's discussion, there are committee meetings and the neurons being humans get together and come up with things and develop things. And some of them develop absolutely wonderful results and, and save people and do great stuff like in a hospital say, and some of them create uh, the Stasi like you were describing. They create a, a, a horrific um, a dystopian world. So they can be for good or evil. But I claim that humans have been uh, dealing with artificial intelligence for an extremely long time and we're pretty good at it. What do you think of that? Um, I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Um... And I, I think the interesting part of that point as well is there are unintended consequences of sort of organizational AI, if you want to think about it like that, where profit maximization, you know, probably the people running massive oil companies and, and you know, I, 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 are not evil people. In general, people aren't evil people. And and weird things happen in groups and weird unintended consequences happen when you're think trying of the to the tobacco industry. Nobody woke exactly. up in the morning thinking I'm going to go to work today and poison right. people. That just was not exactly. what they thought about when they went to go to the field and harvest totally. tobacco and roll it into cigarettes. But so that was the result of the organization, yes. which was really optimized and had a lot of feedback to get it to so be I mean, as good at killing people as possible. So or I think, at least I think making them very ill. So they keep buying. I think there are a few things that I'd say about that. One is that I do believe people are good people in general, and they have decent instincts, and that if stuff starts going off the rails, the people inside that organization will not necessarily want to support its progress. There are horrible counter examples, but I, I, you know, it's like Lord of the Rings. I believe in, you know, I believe that the kind of uh, that good will prevail. Um, the second part of it is the terrifying pace of, um, of, of exponential improvement in the intelligence and power of, of, of this AI relative to the East India company, for instance, is just like, it isn't, you couldn't- Hundreds of years off. before they could enslave a bunch of people exactly. in India and exactly. take over and so on and do things that were awful. Here, it might take hundreds of seconds. Totally, yeah. And then the third one is, is um, that actually regulation, the development of society, the sort of people growing up in a time scale where they're educated about these new technologies and they sort of understand how to integrate the morals or cultural principles of their society 
with these things that can be slightly off in a different direction. And ultimately they, they can come back to sort of uh, good principles that form the backbone of, of humanity. I think those things actually move in a phase where they're reasonably well interrelated. And if people grow up under total oppression, they normally get horribly fed up of it. And then there's a whole generation of people who hate it and rebel against it. And there's kind of, you can, you, it kind of moves and flexes in that sort of way. If you believe in the technical possibility of something approaching a singularity, the pace at which it can outstrip our own understanding of how to control it or to have evolved in a bad situation that we can understand and then wrestle to the ground is at least theoretically, and that's what I'm concerned about, um, uh, not the same as the examples you're giving. I uh, take your point and I'm very interested in it. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on to just one more where I think we, we also might agree um, more than we disagree on some of these other points. Um, and, and that is what uh, uh, I think it's Jeffrey, but it might be Gregory Hinton, um, the uh, father of AI, very, very prominent uh, person at Google, has just announced. So he's quit Google. He says, I want to tell people that AI is something you should worry about. And mm -hmm. uh, as he was announcing that earlier this week, I was thinking maybe I'm on the wrong side of history here. You know, I'm going to yeah. take on Dan, but uh, we, we, we should be discussing this. I think that's what we would definitely violently agree on, you and me, Dan, is that this is a topic worthy of discussion. We should be discussing it more. Um, but what Hinton said was, uh, and it was very interesting, he's most worried about military applications which is as a, as a lifelong pacifist, that's something that's very interesting to me. Um, yeah. And he says, uh, look, uh, Putin could get hold of one of these tools and start using it to program uh, drones and uh, robots that drive or robot tanks and things and, and yeah. target people in Ukraine. That would be a very, that's quite imaginable. And those getting like, out of control is like, also Turkey. imaginable. Yeah, Turkey, Turkey is the leading manufacturer of this basically AI powered drone that just hunts down and kills anything in its, in, in its field of view. Some of the stuff that's happening between China and Taiwan at the moment is like the most sophisticated preparation for technical technological warfare that's ever happened. There was this kind of blackout of GPS technology over Taiwan that happened over the biggest radius that anyone's ever done it before. That was a few weeks ago. So, so yeah, I mean, it's terrifying. It's really, really terrifying. And, and and the thing is, it's 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 not just Jeffrey Hinton. You know, it's 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 a lot of people who've been there throughout the entire evolution of these systems, who also are finding that when they guess, oh, we'll be able to do this thing in three years' time, that thing is then happening in two years' time or one year's time. Even GPT three to four surprised Sam Altman and the people who made it, where they were like, whoa, this is powerful. So if you and, keep and on it came there, faster than they thought. If it's a bit off the curve today, it's going to be more off the curve next time around. And if it starts to have any semblance of this kind of recursive improvement, then then, yeah, you know, we're just going to be chained to a radiator getting 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 flogged by our robot overlords. OK, well, I do want to make sure we get to Jess's point because Jess is being hopeful. And, and Dan, you've also been hopeful, which I'm very glad, you know, people are fundamentally good, says Dan. I, I'm glad to hear that. And I agree. Uh, Jessa says, well, what do we do about this? So uh, what, what would Dan suggest that we do to mitigate these risks? Because as, as you also said, Dan, we're not going to throw this away. You use it multiple times a day. Yeah. I'm programming things all the time in it. Um, it it's hugely useful and beneficial yeah. to large bits of humanity. What the heck do we do to protect ourselves? Yeah. What do you think, Dan? Um, so there's some really, really interesting ideas here and, and i'm just going to be paraphrasing other people's ideas who've thought about this in in, in more, de more detail than i have there's the really extreme end of things which is like you have to shut this down right now i think that argument isn't the right argument because there's an international you know you can call it an arms race if you want to develop the most powerful one of these models india china russia everyone's working at this stuff uh, and the knowledge is out of the box it's it's not like it's, it's, it's hidden somewhere the there would be some way to put it back in the in the nice little container and say you can't touch exactly. this anymore totally so so some people will say okay well what we need is is some kind of i can't remember what the declaration is of, of the thing where basically everyone agreed to not blow each other up with nuclear weapons but, but mutual assured destruction yeah. mad one of uh oh dan froze um uh -oh. else as well that's we were called, just gonna uh, hear coming yeah. yes can you hear can me now sorry we just pre we can Get, go ahead yeah. and tell us what, how do we mitigate um and so 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 you could say okay right well this is this is nuclear threat level international diplomacy anyone who buys a certain amount of hardware that's powered in a particular way anyone who's 
openly working on this stuff, we will, we will nuke you. And this has to be taken a hundred times more seriously than the threat of nuclear war. And there are some people who really, really seriously believe in that idea. Elon Musk has been one of the most vocal people about it really for the last like six or seven years. And he thinks that the AI poses a risk, you know, really a couple of, order of mag orders of magnitude greater than nuclear warfare. So one idea is if you take it that seriously, then it has to be on an international circuit. If you work on this stuff, you immediately obviously like i'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not very pro that but it's an interesting argument um the other version of this i think the reasonable one is is kind of like the the transformers argument of okay well the way to defend ourselves transformers not not in the sense of artificial intelligence people. but that but uh, transformers not as no, the uh, element I mean, of intelligence the but the the, ro the robots for kids that um change into cars okay yes keep going it's more on my level yes <laughs> it's That's great it's is, is, we 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 build benevolent AI to protect us from non-benevolent AI. And, and that's really the direction of, of, of the, the discourse has taken. And that's what this concept of alignment is about, is basically how do you fundamentally engineer AI so that it's aligned with human goals? N nobody knows if that's technically possible, just like worms could ask themselves how they could you know, whisper in the, in the ears of humans not to stomp on worms and to do nice things to them. Maybe it's possible, maybe it's not. But right now, um, if I was going to advocate for anything as per the question, it would be um, it would be for a real shift in the balance away from uh, developing and training these models on larger and larger data sets through to working on alignment. And right now it's 99 percent training and improving the algorithms and one percent on alignment. I think we need a shift to to 90 percent alignment and 10 percent uh, and, and, and 10 percent make it faster. Um, and, and Sophia yeah. is commenting. Uh, in a slightly different direction, the same same idea, but um, this whole movement toward humane tech, tech that is built for humans. What a crazy idea that that might be uh, an approach that could help us. Um, and and, and uh, then you, know, you, have so, you have so many examples in sci-fi of, of, of the difficulty of writing those principles in such a way exactly. that, that they're, um, it's Asimov's laws. Is that, is, that, is that what it is? Yeah. It is indeed a fertile ground for great drama. Um, how can you get around the rules? How can something happen that's surprising and dramatic that uh, changes the rules? The world's actually a little less dramatic than that. And I think that people will find some effective technological ways to um, restrict and mitigate. But I like yeah. Jess's word. How can yeah. we mitigate this? It's not we're going to get rid of it, and it's not we're going to avoid the harms. I think um, we're ready. I'm ready for um, scams like you wouldn't believe, and um, you know yeah. I'm never going to believe a video again. Uh, but yeah. uh, I, I'm not as worried about the world destroying activities. So I don't. I don't yeah. think we, you've convinced me on that one. But uh, we're absolutely 100% agreed that drones that can hunt people down with extra skills that might be augmented by a, a human. Uh, my centaur argument. Yeah. Uh, that, those are pretty dangerous. We yeah. should do yeah. a lot about those. And, well, let me um, give you a couple of other examples of things that really terrified me because I spent a couple of weeks, and, and this is part of my personality. I spent a couple of weeks, literally, I was unable to do anything else. I thought I was like bursting into tears the whole time. I, fi I understood how my friends who are really, really pessimistic about the climate felt and people who say, oh, I don't want to have kids because of the climate. I never understood that. And I was like, oh, I actually get this now. Um, so, so a couple of things that I found quite terrifying if you look up the members of the British Council on AI, it is not the leading technical minds in the UK. It's people who spend a lot of time on like Quango boards. Yeah. Um, so that's fucking terrifying. Uh, sorry, sorry to keep okay. swearing. That's, that's okay. That is, that's this terrifying. is a swear worthy topic. I've never and, looked to government to solve these problems for us. I've, I've looked to, to well, well, individuals. Yeah, but, um, and then if you if you look at you know I, I saw a job ad it went on, it went uh, viral on Twitter of a head of cybersecurity of the UK government and the salary was fifty two thousand pounds, and and I think and you know to, just to to build on the remediation steps I think are necessary I think we need and some people in government actually take this quite seriously which is good but there's a relative lack of understanding um, so I think that anyone who believes that the risks are, are real. Uh, um, I th and that's what I've, trying, I've been trying to do, although it's, 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 it's been getting me down a bit. So I'm doing it at a limited, a limited extent is, is in environments like this to say there are massive possible positive benefits, but we need to take the alignment question and, and the risks really seriously. I think, and this is more controversial, that we need a huge investment in national security, especially in cybersecurity. And, and whether that goes public or, or private, 
I think this stuff is about to get really serious and it's going to be a huge uh, miscalculation if we don't invest in it. And I think a big part of that is also investing in military resources. And, and again, that's really unpopular. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a pacifist as well, but this stuff is about to, it's going to be exponential improvements in, in you know, increases in military, um, in, in military power and warfare techniques and the rest of it. And, 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 it's, these are these are funny times on a on a kind of global macroeconomic level. So so, I'd be advocating for huge investments in understanding and using this technology on a on a on a national scale. Interesting. And the, I I I wanted to close on a positive note, but I think we might close on a sort of bleak note here. Um, the thing I'll reflect on is that you're advocating more military, and I can understand exactly from your position, why you would do that, why we should make more investment there. Um, but of course, what that military is going to do is go try to build what we hope will be the benevolent AI. And they're yep. going to try to build the drones that hunt the drones that hunt the drones that hunt the drones. Um, so um, there, there's a, a bit of a recursive loop there that that scares me. So um, uh, you've, yeah. you've definitely moved, moved my thinking along in that way. Dan, yeah. I want to thank you. Uh, I, I, we're a bit over time, and I appreciate our audience stuck with us, and uh, we had some uh, very good questions and comments. Thank you. Didn't get to all of those. Um, but uh, I'll encourage folks to, uh, first of all, get in touch with Dan. If if, uh, if people want to find you, how could they talk to you more about this topic? Well, I actually, um, uh, as politely as possible, don't really want to talk about it more because because the okay. other the, the final end point Getting you my, down. Okay. My conclusion of all of this stuff is like, what am I going to do about it, you know? And either will be fine or it won't be fine. But much like anything else, you should just sort of focus on 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 like kind of leading a good life and having fun. So 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 in the nicest possible way, please don't talk to me about this. If okay, you do want to, where, where could yeah. people go if they wanted to talk to someone who isn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the place I think is very interesting on this subject, and they organise talks and stuff. Uh, is the and this, these guys will really get you down. Is this is the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, which is based in Cambridge, and and you know, this will be one one of of ten things that is going to wipe out all of human civilization. So if you want to feel really stressed out, you can go and chat to them. But I think they speak really really eloquently about this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's great. That's okay, I'll, I will I will share that so people can. Uh, get in touch there and uh, and find out more. Um, I'm not going to because uh, although I really enjoyed this discussion, I, I haven't got to the level of existential uh, angst and 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 pain that Dan is. I'm still more of an optimist, but um, Dan certainly made me think about some of the risks um, in a in a new way, in a in a very thoughtful way. And we just had some some great comments from uh, Andy and Sophia about uh, how helpful this has been to them. I will just note that uh, we have discussions like this at uh, the Squirrel Squadron, and um, they're not always this uh, earth shattering. Sometimes there's about, they're about whether we should outsource our technology or um, how to have better conversations uh, and get our engineers uh, talking to customers instead of uh, kind of in a, in a hole somewhere. So um, we like doing that. Uh, that happens every single week. Uh, it's absolutely free. There's a forum where we discuss in, the, in between um, weekly emails, all kinds of good things. So um, uh, I'll just encourage folks to uh, have a look over there. Um, I, I promise that uh, next week's uh, topic, which if uh, memory serves is disappointing people, will not be nearly so uh, um, earth shattering and uh, difficult, but will be really helpful uh, to people who want to improve their technology, uh, make uh, a profit from their technology, uh, make their technology teams uh, as effective as possible, whether they're building benevolent AI or uh, a better mousetrap. So um, uh, happy to uh, have Dan here. Thank you again. And to have all of you. Uh, and uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks.